Murder, torture, drug dealing, dog fighting, mortgage fraud. Michael Locke and his crew seemed to do it all. But this crime boss also had legitimate businesses. A barber shop, a home repair business, and a small empire of property. He was an untrained micromanager. Professional business model translated to the criminal world is what sets him apart. He was charismatic and smart, and he dodged law enforcement for more than a decade. Cops and federal agents had their chances at Locke, but he slipped away time after time. Michael Locke had a lot going for him growing up. He had a lights out jump shot and charmed all the girls. But most important was the church here, Locke's grandfather's church on North 12th Street. Michael himself started giving sermons here when he was just eight years old. I was brought up in church. Church is something that I did all my life. I was blessed. I come from a blessed family. I come from a blessed home. My whole family is involved in church. Locke had a real knack for business. In fact, at a sentencing hearing, Judge Michael Brennan suggested that Locke use his intellect to pursue legal business ventures. But Locke wasn't interested in just keeping his businesses legal. He also had his criminal operation, a ruthless enterprise known as the Body Snatchers. Lewis Jackson, one of Locke's top lieutenants, says the gang had a corporate mindset. We felt we were just as hard as the average American worker, if not harder. You go to your job from 9 to 5, we own ours from 9 to 5 but we may have to put in a little overtime. Locke and his crew would lure their victims to his house here on 53rd Street, where they'd beat him and torture him with hot chicken grease, extracting money and drugs from him, and sometimes killing him. Hot grease, hot water, uh, obviously the, the victim would be duct taped, um, pistol whipped. If his family's in the house, they pistol whipped as well, tied up as well, tortured. Um, butane torches on your feet. <laughs> Things like that. Two of Locke's victims met their end here at a house, 4900 West Freebrance. This despite the fact that we are directly across the street from a firehouse and a short distance from a school on West Capitol Drive. One of Locke's victims was killed here in this garage, suffocated and buried in the backyard under concrete. By this point, investigators were getting close to Locke, but they weren't exchanging information. Just four days after the murder, drug investigators were searching the trash in the back. And ten days after that, a homicide detective was interviewing Locke, but they weren't talking to each other, and Locke got away. We were around and we were sniffing right at the time those things were going on. Locke used that house on Freebrands as part of his mortgage fraud operation, which he launched when he was out on work release from prison. He set up shop here in Bayside, where he defrauded banks of millions of dollars and ruined credit scores for dozens of people. He even committed fraud over a jail phone when he was locked up. Well, I mean, baby, do what you do, man. I just like the way 11th Street went, because if that 20-some G's coming up out of there, you know, I'm feeling comfortable with my, um, with my little state here. Locke sold the house on Freebrands, and the new owner wanted to get rid of those concrete slabs in the backyard. That's when the bodies were found. But in a city with typically more than 100 homicides a year, it didn't make that big a news. But for the investigators who had followed Locke for years, they knew what that meant. They knew the house was owned by Locke, and once they saw the brutal nature of these homicides, the urgency of their case picked up. As soon as I heard the name Michael Locke, I knew right away that we were investigating uh, something uh, significant. We knew if we wanted to put him away for any significant amount of time, we had to go after each and every one of those areas. Prostitution, mortgage fraud, drug investigations, any gang-related type incidents. All of those things had to be looked at. In early 2006, law enforcement took the chance to let Locke go. And it was a chance. They were letting somebody go, suspected two homicides and several other crimes. But they had somebody on their side. They had a secret weapon. Lewis Jackson, the former trusted lieutenant of Locks, uh, agreed to secretly record his former boss in their conversations. We're really better than the police. The only thing they got license to do. <laughs> For real. Uh. 
Law enforcement took the risk because they weren't going to settle for a small case. They wanted to put away Locke for good. I needed to get evidence that I would be able to show in a court of law that, that would convict this person uh, beyond uh, a reasonable doubt. Finally, in July 2007, Locke was arrested along with a number of his associates. He was charged with homicide, kidnapping, drug dealing, and mortgage fraud, and he was convicted of all those crimes. He's still charged with prostitution. His wife is charged with prostitution as well, and as of now, she's still standing by her husband. I don't think that my husband is guilty with this. I can't see Michael torturing nobody and killing nobody. I can't see him. The case isn't over. Authorities think there are more bodies out there. In fact, they've dug yards looking for them. There's also the most explosive aspect of the case. There's an allegation that Locke was paying Milwaukee police officers to help him commit his crimes. Locke himself is behind bars, double life in prison is what he received for his crimes. But he's confident. And he's confident he's going to get out very shortly. When you take uh, Daniel in the lion's den, they basically put Daniel in the lion's den. And if you read the Bible and if you read the story about Daniel, not only did they put him in the lion's den, but while he was in the lion's den, the angels came down and they closed the mouth shut of the lions so that the lions could not harm Daniel. And that's basically me. Right now I'm in the lion's den. I got put in the lion's den. And my situation seems impossible. There's no way I'm going to get out. But I'm here to tell you, I will be out of jail real soon. Because what's impossible with man is possible with God.